So, uh, who are you? Uh, my name is Ian Millam. I'm the art director on Dead Space. And we're here at Electronic Arts. Yeah. Uh, getting a tour of the Dead Space team mm -hmm. and playing the game all day long. Yeah. I'm, I'm so played out, I'm worn out. Are you? But it's, it's exciting. It's, oh man, it's scary. Yeah, I know, it's fun. I, I'm really excited to finally, you know, because we've been working on this for like three years. Yeah. So I'm excited to finally be able to, to show it to people and to have them sort of get extended time because you know others sort of you know they're playing for like 10 minutes or whatever and they got a billion things to do but actually have people get a chance to really get into it and, and experience it deeply is fun yeah tell me about what you do because art director i have no concept sure i saw ben wyatt was ben it not yeah, yeah i'm sorry he's the production designer right okay. so he draws a lot and i don't get to draw at all not anymore so okay. uh, I used to be because he draws some horrific. Oh uh, yeah, I know. Where does he come up with it? <laughs> well, his own his own dark abyss of his soul and soul uh, is where most of that stuff comes from. I just sort of go, oh okay, man, and then take it on to the rest of the team. So as art director, bas in the end, it's my job uh, to make sure the game looks great. Uh, I started off uh, working on previous titles, and before I became an art director, that I was uh, on previous titles as an artist doing. Um, so that's my background. But now I don't draw so much, except at the beginning of the project when I'm sort of laying down the early look. Most of my job is to take this whole team of like 80 people and um, make sure that all of their work comes together into a cohesive whole. So I'm managing uh, the color palette and the overall vibe and the, and, the, and the look and the sort of artistic DNA of the project and sort of making sure that it all comes together into something that, that looks like one artist uh, did it. Yeah. So I'm sort of the artistic leader. What's the secret to doing that? Because that, that's the problem with uh, software, right? Microsoft Windows, a piece over here yeah. acts a little different than here. My iPhone's email doesn't turn, you know. It's but hard, the web right? Browser and, does. And when like, and we, and the the ideas are coming from all over different places, right? So we got a guy that's inventing these terrible monsters, and then another guy that's inventing the the technology of of whatever the suit or how the holograms work, and then an army of other people who are just painting. Um, what the backgrounds and the worlds look like, right? And they need to, industrial design in the world influences other industrial designs, right? And the world has a certain cohesiveness, or if it, if it doesn't relate, it, that's done intentionally for some way. So it's my job to make sure that all, that all the decisions have decision making behind them, if that makes sense, where we are doing things intentionally uh, that communicate something specifically. So um, to do my job, uh, for most of the first part is figuring out what those rules are. Like on Dead Space, we use the principles of Gothic architecture for our worlds, and here's how, and here's why, and here's what we're going to do. So how that's do the beginning start, of the project. How do you start that? You know, I mean, how do you sit down as a maybe? Four it was tough, or right? Because it's like previously I've worked on things like James Bond or Star Wars, where those things have a long lineage uh, and a visual language. This was clean slate, so all we had was how we wanted it to feel, or you know, the designer of somebody would be like, oh, you shouldn't feel comfortable in these spaces. And I'd be like, okay, what are spaces I don't feel comfortable in? Um, the dentist's office, uh, underground, anywhere where the ceiling, I'm a tall guy, anywhere where the ceiling is a little too low, even here isn't great, uh, where you've got like things like right on your head, right? Yeah. Um, you know how, you know, like on, you see sailors on ships, right? They go through those narrow doorways and everybody sort of has that sort of claustrophobic feeling. So then it's my job, either through painting myself or by getting other artists um, to do paintings, to go to them and be like, see this picture of this, you know, dentist's light? Like, you know, how that comes down? I want our light fixtures to feel like this dentist's light does, because that makes me feel about it. And, and, and a million different examples like that, that's my job, is to sort of take how the creative director and the executive producer wants it to feel and be, translate that into visual direction, and then as those things are getting built, bring all those elements together, and 
and make the Did world. Did you study any military ships, like uh, aircraft a little, carriers? Because it feels a little bit like that. A little. Actually, we did study aircraft carriers um, quite a bit, because those are the only things that are close to as big as what uh, the ship that our thing takes place on, right? So I did um, listen to uh, some radio documentaries about uh, aircraft carriers, for, and even culturally, that led to a lot of stuff. Like on this uh, aircraft carrier, um, there are four garage bands on this car aircraft carrier. Or um, there was two people's jobs whose whole job was refilling vending machines. Like they joined the Navy, right, to like load bombs and planes and stuff. No, no, they do vending machines, 12 hour shifts. And it was sort of, that gave us inspiration for um, just how the culture worked and that not necessarily everybody in this big company that we made where this whole thing takes place is doing the core um, work product that the company does, right? There's support, there's communication, there's IT, there's a bunch of different things. And we wanted to build that into the world because it helps you believe it. And so we put like little, uh, like little like helper phones on the wall, like the security team and like that kind of stuff. Don't actually do anything, <laughs> but by having it on the wall, it implies a larger world. We have vending machines, again, because it just sort of implies a larger world. And when you see, you even see parts where the food that is in that vending machine, you see where it comes from. Yeah. And that sort of ecology was uh, pretty cool. It, in some places, you have to keep things familiar, even though you're hundreds of years in the future, right? Yeah. We, we, it's some, uh, I think it was Ben who talked about the uh, fire hydrants. Mm -hmm. They look like today's fire hydrants. He, he said, well, if I really thought about it, to, you know, fire hydrants in 200 years aren't going to look anything like Well, you look at like, um, what people, what futurists like Sid Mead and some of these other guys do, you know, the, the guy behind Tron and that sort of thing, like where they sort of extrapolate what things in the future are going to look like and just look at stuff today. Like if you pulled that iPhone out yeah. and showed it to somebody from the 50s and said, this is a telephone, that like their mind would boggle, right? And if you, but if you didn't, if you weren't allowed to say what it was and you just put it on a table and you said, hey, 50s guy, what is that? Like they're not going to know. They wouldn't even think it turns on. Like they yeah. don't even, they don't even get anything about that. So well, and, in the early uh, Star Trek movies, uh, somebody picked up a mouse off of the Macintosh. Oh, right, right. Uh, Star Trek four, right? Yeah. He talk he talks to it. He computer. He talks to it into the mouse, right? He thinks it's a voice thing. It's that kind of problem as of when you're communicating visually, if I because we're a sort of a scary horror game, right? Yeah. And if it's not relatable, um, it's not that horrific. Like when you see bad things happen in a completely abstract context, it's not that relatable. You're not sort of, <gasps> you don't feel anything about it. So visually, yes, we did some things that we intentionally left alone, even though it's 500 years in the future, so people can um, relate to them more. So we have things like um, spools of wire and fire extinguishers, and even um, I had them put in um, like tabletop fans that like have an iron like hand guard on them and a little, like a little desktop fan, right? Even desktop fans now are like these plasticky guys, they, they do that thing and you could put your finger right in them. And, but compared to a fan from the 30s, it, it, it has much more fanness, if that makes any sense. Do you know what I mean? And when you see it, oh, that's a fan, and if I put my finger in that, that would hurt. And you can see that. And then when you put it next to some super advanced PDA or another tech gadget, next, like people buy the new thing much more because they, they didn't have to spend energy buying whatever the super techie you know, fire extinguisher was. So wow. yeah, and you, it, my job is making those types of decisions over and over and over again. Now, how, how did you get to that point? Is it the focus group feedback, like that you're not? That's too late. By it's the time, late. yeah, we have to make it. By that time, it's too late. Um, most of my audience, when I'm doing these sorts of decisions, are the other people on the team, and they don't always agree, right? There's a fair amount of my job is to evangelize, and be able to communicate. No, no, I'm doing this for a reason. Hold on, trust me, because. <laughs> Um, there's a sort of funny phrase about, about games, which was, you know, games look like crap until they look awesome. Because they, they don't tend to just get better looking and better looking and better looking, and then here they are done in this sort of nice little linear passion, fashion. They look terrible visually because there's so much tech, there's so much work going on, there's so much foundational technology being built before we can finally do our artwork that my job for a long way is to use paintings and stories and things to be like, this is how it's gonna feel, and the lights are gonna turn off, and yes, I know that fire extinguisher looks boring, yeah. but there's a, I'm making it look that way um, for a reason. 
Yeah. Yeah. It, it, some of the tech in this game is mm -hmm. a new lighting engine, a new yes. engine that lets you use more lights in, in the yeah. game. Tell me what that let you do as an artist. It's, it's really cool. I mean, we knew from the start um, that on a spaceship, you're going to have a million light sources, right? There's little diodes and flashing lights, all of this kind of stuff. And they're man-made. You're not out in the desert with one big light, the sun, sort of you know, shining down on everything. There's a million light sources. In previous generations of technology, we had to pre-bake most all of our lighting. So it looked good, but it couldn't move. And in terms of light... So you couldn't have a light swinging? You or? could, but you could have like one. Yeah. And uh, in terms of lights that affected the world, like live, you could have maybe four, and maybe one could move. Well, um, we decided to go for something really aggressive, and you know, I won't bore you with the, the super technical no, details, get, get, but it's, it's, <laughs> defer it's, it's deferred lighting. So yeah. all the, lots of the lighting calculation is done offline in a 2D space. And it's in, and then brought back in with a Z buffer to do like a whole. It's I, even I don't know the math. We've got guys that know the math I filmed, much better than I, I filmed I an hour long tech talk. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was See, amazing. Yeah, and what that essentially does is uh, it lets us tune lights live, and we can basically now have infinite lights, and they can all move and animate as much as we want because it's all live lighting as opposed to before. Is this the first game with that technology? Uh, Yes and no. To do to the f deferred, we're one of the very first, yes, to, to ship with deferred lighting because it completely changes the way that the game is rendered and thought about in terms of most of the time, most games are rendered back to front and it's sort of like, okay, I'm going to do this part and then do this part, here's the transparent part, to the camera. Deferred, there is no concept of depth in that traditional way. And it's a, so certain things like transparency become much harder and they have to be rendered in a standard forward way. But other things become much easier because the concept of light is almost different. Um, but that's, yes, that now we are basically, if we wanted to, we could render a million lights. We would choke the machine, yeah. and it wouldn't be able to run at any kind of acceptable frame rate. So that makes us dial it back down. Yeah. But it's still um, many factors more lights than we've had um, available previously. And moving them and animating them costs no more than, than standard. So more than any game I've ever been a part of, or more than any I've seen, the lights move, they animate, uh, sirens turn on and shadows cast on everything, and it's a, it's a completely live lit world. Yeah, it's probably, the, the lighting is probably our strongest uh, technical advance. The, the other thing that uh, my friends who are playing the game uh -huh. today were saying was the audio is awesome. Yeah. I, I, in the process of coming up with the art and the visual in the, mm -hmm. in the room, how, what do you guys think about audio? Yeah. It's, it's tricky, right? Because again, the audio guys have a certain unenviable position because they're frequently last, right? They don't know what they're scoring or what the, how the audio is going to fit in traditionally until they can see what the hell is going on. Yeah. And because we don't get that done until almost the end, the audio guys sometimes have a big crunch. There's a huge portion in the beginning where they're getting the orchestral score. Um, we had a whole full orchestra, and they just had the orchestra do really sort of backwards and weird things, like just sort of rub their bows differently, or just sort of <laughs> that just make these sort of unholy noises and stuff like that. And then there was a part, yes, where we do all the video stuff, and we sort of get everything looking a certain way, and then we're working with the audio guy. But again, it's the same issue. It doesn't exist yet. It doesn't look great yet. Um, I've got to sort of talk to the audio guy and be like, oh, okay, here's how it should be. <laughs> Sometimes I'm doing nothing and counting on the audio guy to help me out. There's a sequence near the beginning of the game we just finished where there's literally six seconds of black, dead black. And I had to trust that the audio guys were going to fill in something in that black that made that black make sense, right? Because it's, you know, it's it, really scary. And really scary, right? <laughs> and because otherwise it feels like, hey, what happened? Why is the thing black? And it's not, it's not entertaining in that moment. It feels like maybe the game broke. And we had to really trust the audio guys. And there was definitely pushback from people like, oh, this is too long. Can we cut it down to like two seconds? And because the audio wasn't in there, as soon as the audio came in, people were like, oh, this should be longer. We should put this to like eight seconds of black. So you really get, you have some chance to breathe. And uh, yeah, it's tricky. Uh, that you just sort of have to, you develop a shorthand and a trust with the other members of the team that they are going to integrate well with what you're trying to do. <laughs> Thank you. 
you guys are located between Silicon Valley and San Francisco. Mm -hmm. How important is it to be here? Could you do your job anywhere else in the world? Or well, tell I mean, me a little bit about the, the, the culture industry, of the valley. Yeah, the industry is definitely centered here. Um, there's a couple other places. L.A. has some. You know, it's funny. You see the traditional entertainment and technology centers are where you see it. A little bit in Seattle, a lot in L.A. But here is where you get sort of the big mix of entertainment and technology. Um, and especially now that we're sharing so many, literally the tools and frequently the people with film industry people, right? Most of our lighting team um, came from film and they were able to transfer a lot of those skills right over to what, um, to what we're doing. And then of course you've got the rich, rich sort of artistic tradition of the city in San Francisco and, and sort of trying things um, differently, I think. So yes, I, would, I wouldn't want to do it uh, anywhere else. Yeah. And yet of course, easy accessibility to other entertainment stuff. You know, we, we're, we're doing things. There is a movie being made, so that part is happening in LA, but those guys can be here. We, we can, you know, trade back and yeah. forth in just a little bit. Um, but yeah, having that sort of uh, technology influence and entertainment influence in this one spot, I think is pretty cool. Uh, what, tell me a little bit about your workspace, because we're not allowed to go up there with our cameras. What, yeah. What, what do your workspaces look like, and what, what are your tool well, sets? What most you, people, so everybody on the team would have, um, all development's done on PCs, just because the applications typically are pretty niche oriented. Some of it we have to, you know, homebrew, right? So uh, it, we're just developing on the PCs just because it's an easier platform, and, and for that, cut for because these tools, there might be very few of them around. And then um, dual monitors, uh, most everything. We try to discourage developing on the PC in terms of actually looking at the game on the PC. I mean, except for when we're actually making a PC game, but. Um, when you're working with HDTV sets and NTSC um, sort of televisions and that kind of stuff, TSC, what, NTSC is the, oh, uh, NTSC. Is the you're right, it's the American Television Standard yeah. versus the PAL and that kind of stuff. Um, it can do really wacky things to color, and so we're always trying to look at things natively. So everybody on their desk pretty much has an Xbox 360 development kit, a PC, PS3 development kit, an HDTV, a dual monitor setup to a PC. Artists are all using Wacom tablets for most of their. Um, or Wacom. I so think. digitizing tablet, probably a big right. One. So all, most all of our artwork is done digitally, um, start to finish. Some guys prefer to do um, pencil work and just old, good old fashioned pencil work, and then scan it and take it to color from there. But most guys paint f digitally from the start, um, and frequently you can't even tell, especially if they're using. Are painter. they working in Photoshop or? Are you some, some guys uh, prefer Painter. I don't really try to um, enforce too much on the tool side because in the end, all we want are images. Uh, from the concept artist, so they should use whatever media they feel the most comfortable with. Some guys use Painter because they feel more comfortable in the way that it emulates natural media. You can get it to bleed like a watercolor or emulate stuff that they're used to. Other people use Photoshop because it's more um, suited towards altering the, the frame itself and, and doing things, you know, image manipulation versus just generation, but that's sort of a personal choice yeah. um, thing. And then Maya, ZBrush, Mudbox, a, a, whole, suite, uh, a whole suite of things. Yeah. yeah. Until I saw that some of the wireframes and stuff, I, uh -huh. I had no concept of how something got from a 2D art yeah. piece of art that was done basically on paper or yeah, on yeah. a Wacom tablet into this 3D world that I can move around and my uh -huh. camera can move uh -huh. and the lights can come on. Yeah. How, it's cool. What, tell me a little bit about how you take that flat art uh -huh. and paint it onto a 3D Well, surface. It, it depends on which side we're talking about. So for like, let's take one of our monsters, right? So in the beginning, it's a, uh, it's a Photoshop sketch by an artist, usually based on a visual description from me, or you know, sort of like, oh, we want this guy to feel like, or whatever, we all meet together, we'll see what we're gonna do. So he'll paint it uh, in Photoshop, usually several versions before we get one that we all agree on. Um, we had some monsters that took 70 paintings before they got approved. And then from that, sometimes that person, sometimes someone else, will do a really rough 3D sculpt, uh, depending in Maya or, or ZBrush or something like that, and that's sort of a very, rudimentary 3D model just to establish the sort of weight and form and sort of, you know, is it a barrel-chested guy? How does his ankle work? All that kind of stuff. Because in a painting, unless you do several paintings that are very, very accurate, it's difficult to sort of see him from all angles. So we'll do that. No texture, no nothing. Just sort of think of it like a naked mannequin, right? Everybody will look at that. And then we'll sort of give him a rough skeleton uh, in the 3D uh, package and sort of start moving him around and you'll, and you'll understand, oh, what looked great you know, he'll get, this looks cool, but then it turns out he's got pathetic little Tyrannosaurus Rex hands and he can't really accomplish anything, he's not very scary, so we'll redesign or do whatever. 
So once we got some rough animation of the guy and all, none of this could make it into the game. It's very, it's all so rough, and it's just designed for quick iteration. Let's see it. How's it work? Does everybody like what we're making? Does it feel right? Okay, good. Now we got that. Now it goes to the big wide team. So a character artist takes that pretty rough rudimentary sculpt and spends a month making a super high res ultimate resolution and detail model of the um, of the character in what we call a T pose, where they're like this, right? They're straight out, so you can see every bit of detail, and that is completely without limit. And then um, from that, the in engine models get derived, and we make different resolutions of that depending on how um, how many are in the game or what the needs are. That'll be done in, in Maya or something like that. And all the maps that go on him, our guys sometimes have up to uh, four or five different maps that that should that dictate the native color, the specularity, how shiny it is, the ambient occlusion, like how sort of in the crevices, how dark he gets, that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, the normal mapping, which is adding details um, above and beyond what the actual polygons hold. The normal map actually perturbs the light vector depending on the pixel, so it'll it'll make it appear as if it's got a lot more detail than it actually does. Um, and some even have even more than that. Some maps actually have several maps hidden within them to control specular eccentricity versus specular strength and all this kind of stuff to make metal look like metal and blood look like blood and all that kind of business. And then that goes to a whole rigging team that apply the, um, the sort of skeleton and controls and then that goes to the animation team who make him move and then that all gets handed off eventually to uh, a whole separate application that um, uses that creates a whole move tree and state machine they call it for the guy right where he might you know if he's gonna attack but a million things could happen in the game before he finishes that attack so there's a whole um, AI machine that sort of has to figure out what he would do in those circumstances that all goes to the game engine and there you go yeah and that's just the guy that's just that we're not even talking about the player character or the worlds which have their own separate pipeline or the UI or the VFX uh, or the post effects, or any of the other sort of stuff. So they've all got these very intricate, um, sort of their own pipelines that have been developed over years and years and years of, of sort of experimentation and need, and, and then we sort of polish it up. So you, you're, you're pretty close to ending a project. Yeah. You know, a month or two, right? You're going to take a couple months off or a month well, off or something. We'll see. And then you're going to start a new me. thing. What kinds of people are you looking to hire for the next thing? I mean, uh, you know, mm -hmm. those kinds of skills are not normal everyday skills that it's know. tricky and it's definitely depending on the phase of the project we need a whole different set of skill set right in the beginning it's very bounce ideas back and forth hey what would you do we need people that are quick um, quick modelers lots of concept artists people that just sort of paint um, frequently they come in on a contract basis or they're freelancers maybe they'll have a style casting a contract uh, contract artist is a lot like casting an actor right um, if we have an idea where we want something just really, really scary, there are artists who specialize in doing really scary stuff. Or maybe they draw great technology, and we'll bring them in when we need that stuff. So a lot of artists in the beginning. But then once we've figured out most of our designs, we don't need those people as much. Some of them stay on to do textures in the game. Other, sometimes they move on to other projects. So that in the beginning, it's a lot of dreamers and a lot of whatever. In the middle, it's a lot of um, getting down on the silicon guys who can make it work, right? Either uh, engineers and, and guys who write tools that let other artists do their thing. And then it gets much more business oriented. Okay, how can we sort of make these, how are we gonna R&D this stuff? What's an ideal skeleton with all these controls? Then it goes super wide and we just need um, a ton of people. We need modelers, we need animators, we need uh, texture painters. And by that point, the, the pipeline is fairly well settled and it's a matter of we need people to churn art, and and that's sort of when it when the horsepower really kicks in, and then towards the end, um, it's people that sort of have their fingers in everything, and when something's broken, they can figure out how to how to fix it and, and all that kind of stuff. And then we take a couple months off and we start it all over. Of course, that process could take years. So, yeah. this has been awesome. Thanks, could, man. I really I appreciate you stopping all day. by. It's cool. <laughs> I, I love have, to. I, love I to can come talk about this all day. Well, I'd love to be a fly on the wall in your team and just yeah. watch how you come up with these ideas because they're just crazy. Thanks, man. And Thanks. the game's a lot of fun. Cool, so. cool. I'm glad you like it. Thank you.